Okay, uh, hi everyone, um, my name is Michael. Um, so I am, uh, as, as uh, Kang Chun said, I'm the founder of the engineers of SG. Uh, and essentially, uh, I'll be sharing a little bit about what we, uh, what <laughs> some of the things that we've done uh, for, for, for this. Um, yeah, so Engineers SG is a website where we, we record uh, different meetups and in Singapore. So we record the videos and we put them all online. Uh, you can go check them on engineers.sg. But today uh, I'll be sharing a little bit about uh, how deploying your Rails on-premise. On so yeah, so I didn't actually prepare any slides. I just have a Word doc, uh, Google Doc and I hope you guys can have a look at it and see my notes from there. Um, essentially, right, so why would you want to deploy uh, Rails on-premise on when uh, there are so many options in the cloud? Um, so some of the reasons I've encountered in the past, uh, so these are some of the reasons why why go, why go on-premise. So number one would be re security reasons. So somebody uh, basically said, hey, um, you should uh, put only, 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 uh, only um, you should put highly classified information on-premise on and not only the less classified information uh, can go into the public cloud, right? So like, for example, in Singapore, we have like uh, un un unclassified, restricted, uh, and then uh, confidential and then secret, right? So we, based on uh, some of the cl security classifications, there, there, also, there are requirements of where you can host the information. For example, if you're doing, dealing with bank data, uh, banking data where a lot of user information is involved, um, you might want to put them all on premise rather than putting it in a public cloud. Or it could be a regulatory thing, like uh, there, there's some regulations from, like if you're with a bank, uh, then there's probably some um, monetary authorities uh, regulation that say you have to put all your data on, on premise and you can you know, harden your servers and all other things. La. Um, yeah, air gap is another thing. Sometimes you just want to prevent you from putting, you want to put data on premise and make sure that you can't, uh, no one can get to it. Um, sometimes it also could be that you don't want to spend money on the public cloud or Heroku. You know, sometimes when you put stuff on the public cloud, uh, it can be a little bit expensive. Uh, like uh, even though they charge by the per CPU or per per hour per per minute kind of thing, even with things like uh, serverless technologies, it can be by the per second. But cumulatively, you add up quite a lot. And you compare it with having your physical uh, data center uh, is at least with a data center it's a sunk cost. You you fix it's a fixed cost. You bought this use machine and there's no more, there's no additional cost involved other than electric electricity. Uh, whereas you put on the public cloud, even you put it in there you, after a while, you kind of like you do spend a bit more on the public cloud than on on physical uh, buying physical servers. Um, the other reason that you could, might have this is, at least in my previous company, what we did was we actually already have our own data center, and this is, uh, the guys would say, "Hey, we have our own data center. Where are you putting stuff on the cloud?" So, um, yeah, and sometimes it's also about not sure if this will work. Yeah, so there are some pe people who say that, "Oh, yeah, but uh, you, public cloud, yeah, but you know, why why would this 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 doesn't work?" And we just waste a lot of money in doing putting this up in the cloud, right? So. So yeah, so this, so these are some of the reasons I've seen. Um, I'm not sure whether you've seen other reasons uh, before, but this is the ones that at least I've encountered. So when you're thinking about putting uh, your Rails app on, in in the public in on premise, uh, the first question I would ask ourselves is how serious are you, right? I mean, are you just um, play play, being just experimenting, or are you uh, trying to are you or do you already have a validated idea? Right, so as in you are uh, already reached a point where you you are pretty sure you want to do this, and this is production data. You want to put, you basically want to productionize it. Um, so today my my slides will be more about uh, the experimenting part because it's more of like uh, the scenario could be you're introducing uh, Ruby and Rails into your enterprise or in your company for the first time, and you don't really have much. Uh, experience actually working with it. You just want to make, sh uh, you want to validate and do a build MVP. Basically, you want to build something simple uh, that could validate your ideas and then to tell, to prove to the stakeholders that you can actually uh, build something easy in in Rails and people can use it, lah. Right. So that's the that's the idea. Um, so yeah. So uh, at least in my previous company, when we when we first started out using um, uh, Ruby. 
uh, it was it was kind of an experimental thing because we used, we didn't have a they they could they were they were still in the process of purchasing this thing called uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, uh, which is an on premise platform as a service kind of thing. But before we went full on with uh, platform, this platform as a service, we wanted to validate that we can actually build uh, a, a simple Rails app and kind of like and let people see how it looks like and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, so essentially when you're experimenting on premise, there is basically no cloud. So uh, there's no cloud, tech, there's no cloud like data services that you can refer to and all that stuff. There's no auto deployment and all that, all that stuff. So essentially, you have to roll a lot of things on your own, now, right? So no, no cloud, but no cry. <laughs> don't need to cry whether you don't have a cloud. But anyway, um, right. So what? So first question when you look at uh, build, uh, deploying uh, Rails in, in on premise is first of all, what are my constraints? What are the things that are limiting me from uh, doing the best as I can here, right? Like we are so used to having things like GitHub and then Travis CI or Circle CI and then having all these other things, auto deployment and all that stuff. You will take all these things for granted in a way because it's so easy to use. But on premise, you basically have to roll a lot of things on your own. You got to do a lot of things on your own, right? And uh, right. So first of all, why your why your premise uh, constraints on on premise? First of uh, question would be: Do you, are you using virtual machines or do you need? Are you running on bare metal servers? Bare metal servers are basically like your physical server that you they need to uh, install the OS, got hardening harden it and all the other things, lah. Right. So that's the that's the uh, th so you have quite uh, and so we you need to, you, we need to use virtual machines. Uh, then the question is uh, what uh, uh, how how can you get access to it? Uh, how do you connect to it? And how do you how do you go about uh, getting the getting your virtual machines spun up for you? For example, if you are working uh, in close to your IT, you can you need probably need to uh, sign a request form uh, with your IT department to basically request for a virtual machine. You might want to have a physical you want to have a, a, a fixed IP for that for your virtual machine as well, so you can always re refer to it. And even a fully qualified domain name that you can refer to. So that internally, you can just go to go to a browser, open URL, and you can see it inside. Um, next thing will be what, what what are the operating system? What is the operating system you're using? Because that that actually determines how you will go about <coughs> installing uh, the packages and dependencies on your machine. So in in many cases, if it's a, a Linux server uh, running Ubuntu or maybe Red Hat, then you probably have a few things you can you, you can do uh, Next thing in my, our mind is, uh, do you have internet connectivity? So for example, if you're doing this on premise and uh, your your machines have full access to the internet, so that means things like bundle install and you know, all that will come quite easily la. Because as you're building a, a application on on Ruby and on Rails, you probably need to download a lot of uh, gems, uh, Ruby gems and stuff. So you probably need to you want to be able to have internet connection. <coughs> and sometimes when you don't have direct internet connection, you probably have a, a proxy server. So if you have a forward proxy, then you probably need to set some environment variables, uh, like say uh, HTTP proc. Oops, what did I do? Uh, so HTTP uh, proxy, right? So this is probably important to set up or HTTPS, right? So these are probably two things you want to you want to set up uh, in your environment so that you can actually go go online, right? Uh, right. So let me just format this. Next thing you want to ask is how do you have root access? Do you have root access to the machine? Because the server you are you, in that server, you probably need to install a fair bit of software. So you probably want to ask uh, ask and make and make sure that you have some form of root access, or maybe at least some sudo access, so they can install the install the uh, install so software packages. Because a lot of Ruby uh, a lot of Ruby packages uh, Ruby gems it will probably need, require some native. Uh, libraries, so you want to make sure that you have some form of access to be able to download or install additional packages that is needed. Like so, like say if you're on Red Hat, you want to be able to do some uh, some RPM install or or yum install to install additional packages that's needed by uh, some native packages needed for the for the gems. 
Um, next question in my mind would be, do you have a budget? Do you have a budget? Is that like a small claims purchase you need to do? Or is it some internal transfer of money that so that you can actually go about great getting all this done? So is that more the more the, so up here all the really administrative uh, things you probably need to get clear before you can you want to jump into this, um, right? Uh, right. So next thing to do is probably if you you were given a VM, it probably will be a, uh, a Linux VM. So you probably want to find out what, how much you know about uh, Linux server admin. So you probably need to figure out how to actually log in using SSH and then using. Um, and then uh, change to the sudo user to kind of do the install and packages. So uh, there's one website that I, I used to go to. It's called How to Forge. So How to Forge is quite helpful. It, it's like a online a bunch of online tutorials that teach you how to administer, uh, how to go about administering or administering your uh, even setting up your own uh, Linux servers. And you saw a lot of fabulous of, uh, instructions on how to do stuff. So I recommend checking it out if you if you are really total noob with uh, like managing your own Linux servers so that you can at least get some experience with that. Otherwise, you probably have to rely on some DevOps folks that can help you, who can sit with you and probably give you some advice on how to do stuff. Um, so, so, uh, so you got your server, uh, you got your server figured out, you're going to use a VM, uh, you picked up some basic uh, uh, Linux server admin means uh, uh, commands. So the next thing you want to do is now to actually start installing uh, Ruby on your on this server. Uh, first up, you want to make sure you can install Ruby. Uh, and there are many ways of doing installing Ruby, like kind of like how we do this on the local development environment. We want to have some form of version management uh, of Ruby. So you can also do the same thing with uh, RVM uh, on on. And RVM has a very interest has a package called Ubuntu RVM, which lets you like install. Uh, it's like an installer, so you just run this installer, and you can basically run uh, install uh, RVM into your Debian or Ubuntu users, la. right? So it's, it's some some the instructions here are quite uh, straightforward. As long as you have sudo access, you probably can install. You need to install some prop, uh, some uh, additional packages, and then then you can do the uh, RVM install. Once you have this installed, then you can then you have Ruby in your machine. Uh, if you don't like RVM, you are not familiar how to use RVM. There's also uh, RBN, so you can use RBN to do the installation. So with RBN, there is a RBN installer package as well, so you can uh, install both uh, RBN installer and the doc uh, RBM doctor. So it's kind of both up, and both of this does require you to have uh, Git Git installed. Uh, on the machine, so that's probably one of the first dependency to do, to install Git on your on the on the server that you're using. Uh, right, so and or you can just use Git uh, straight up to just uh, install the R RBM. Uh. So once you got RBM installed, you then you can switch to the user and then you can do stuff. Uh, there might be those situation where uh, your your DevOps folks can, or even your oper IT operations folks will tell you, hey, we only have uh, our, we only support Java on our server. Uh, they can or you can only ja install Java there. So for those folks, uh, you can actually try using JRuby. JRuby is, uh, the nice thing about JRuby is basically it's fully, uh, is basically Ruby running on the Java virtual machine. So on the Java runtime. Uh, uh, what I like about uh, R J Ruby is that it's just one single file. It's one single file you just need to download. And once you have this binary downloaded and put in the correct folder, you can basically start using J Ruby. I think the latest version supports up to Ruby 2.5, which is uh, 2.5x, which is kind of nice. Um, so yeah, so I've, I've used this in one of my previous uh, clients uh, place. So basically they it's also quite a lockdown, lockdown environment, and they basically have to. So the only thing you could install there was a Ruby package, uh, and then we basically found that you could use JRuby. So another question you might also have is, what if you don't really have a Linux server, you only have a Windows server? So this is where it gets a bit tri more trickier. So if you're only you are on a uh, Windows server, there are also some options you can try. This one is uh, a Ruby installer for Windows, so you can use Ruby installer to kind of like. Uh, this is a package provided by the Ruby uh, Ruby language uh, maintainers. So you can use this to install uh, Ruby on Windows and then you can basically start running this on your Windows uh, server. Uh, for example, if you are only given a virtual machine that runs Windows uh, Windows Server 2008 or something, so then you probably want to use this something like this. 
Of course, in a more modern system, you can also uh, try and get the Windows the subsystem for Linux installed as well. So I have a little, I have a little, I'll share this. I can actually share, wait, let me, let me share, let me share this Google Doc. Uh, if you can, let me try and share this Google Doc with you guys so you can actually go in there and see. Um, right, there's also another uh, document which I which I prepared some time ago uh, for uh, this thing called Tech Ladies. So we did a Tech Ladies Bootcamp and we have some, uh, some of our participants who are only running uh, Windows. So this is basically the setup that we use. Um, basically, you first have to turn on developer mode in Windows, uh, then you enable the subsystems, and then you set up Bash on Ubuntu. There's a, so there's a few, few, few simple steps. Uh. So in any case, uh, right, so so that's, uh, that's all there is to the installing Ruby. So once you have Ruby in there, so the, the next, um, yeah, I'll definitely put all this uh, information into GitHub uh, issue as well. So I will put, add the link to the GitHub issue. Anyway, um, right, so so you now have all this, um, yeah, I have Ruby installed on your machine. Great, What on oh, there's a virtual machine. Uh, so what's next? Um, so so up next are some of the considerations when developing your application for on-premise. First up is what kind of databases are you going to use, right? Uh, does, your, does your server actually support that database that you want? Like say you're using Postgres, or MariaDB, Mariah or uh, SQLite. So if you really start with something really simple, you probably want, and you're just experimenting, you might just want to install SQLite, which is um, so that you can uh, basically uh, uh, do this without installing additional stuff. Um, but if you really want to really go all out, you can probably try and get like a, a Postgres or something installed. Usually, you have uh, a root access, you can probably install all these addi addi additional things. La. Right, so because uh, there might be implication of how much space you want to allocate, in, in, and also the question of whether you can run, or whether there's, uh, your server is beefy enough to run all these things, you might even want to go with like, don't even, don't, you don't even need a server at all, just run everything in, in memory. So it could be another option. Especially if you're doing just an API server, you want to test something or with JSON. So you can, be, you can basically spin up an API server using Rails Rails dash dash API, and uh, even turn off the active record, so you don't need to even bother with the database. Just deal with uh, Ruby uh, objects running around. Um, next question in my mind is uh, how do you actually have access to the to the internet to do bundle install? So something to think about uh, uh, running things on premise is that you want uh, or rather do, doing uh, developing in Ruby. Uh, on Rails, you want to do bundle install and it downloads the whole internet uh, for the, all the gems that you need. Uh, usually, you would need to have access to Ruby Gems uh, the website so they can actually uh, do the uh, to get the, the actual packages that you need. But in cases where you don't have actual internet access on the on the on the machine on the virtual machine, what you could do is use a thing, thing called bundle package. So basically, for your development environment, your development PC, your development laptop. I'm sure. I assume your dev laptop has, has at least some internet connection on a dev laptop. What you do is do a bundle install first, and then you do this running package called bundle package. So bundle bundler has a way of like uh, downloading all your gems and putting them into a folder called vendor cache, right? So which means you basically can download all the gems that you need and put it into a cache folder, and then when you need uh, when you uh, and then you basically check in this folder into your git repo and when you check out the folder on the server you just type bundle install dash dash local so what this will do is it will refer to the vendor cache folder and just install the gems that are on your local machine rather than going to the internet and downloading it so it's quite it'll be quite convenient for if you are working in a restricted environment where you don't have internet access uh, so next step and next question is do you have node.js uh, on, on the uh, server as well. Because I think right now, nowadays we use Webpack uh, and even uh, the old Sprockets as a, uh, as a compilation. You want to be, you need some form of Java, or that's a JavaScript uh, environment, right? So for example, in some of the older uh, Rails apps, you can use uh, exec.js. Uh, recently, I've been using this thing called Mini, I think it's... Mini Ray Rista. Uh, yeah, Mini Racer, yes, Mini Racer, Ruby Racer. So these are the few you can use to basically also run and compile your assets uh, on the server itself. 
But if you have a but you're in a situation where you don't you really can't get JavaScript uh, or exact JS or anything on the server side, what you could do is you can do a pre compilation on your on your on your local machine and you check in the public assets folder. And we check in that uh, the, the folder. You then you don't need to do the asset compilation on the server side, la. right? So, uh, so that's the that's all we. That's, so that's uh, these are some of the considerations you you should uh, take note of when developing uh, for a on premise environment. Uh, next thing is about so yeah now you've written your app you're ready you've developed your app you're ready to go. The next question is how do you deploy it? So uh, if you don't have a git you don't have a git server where you can do a git pull from you can just simply zip up the folder and SCP the file onto the server or if you have git that is very much easier so you just uh, make make your server uh, do a, you can just log in there and just do a git clone or git pull right so you just get the latest uh, copy of the changes here you get, if, if you're a bit more exp there's even a more advanced way which, which you can you can set up your v virtual machine as a git server so you just push into the folder in the in the server itself so there's a bit more advanced but i'll probably try and find the tutorial and share that and running your app on the on the server is also uh there's some considerations um first up you can run uh, your Rails server just by typing bundle exec Rails uh, Rails S, uh, and what you do is oh if I left out something bundle exec Rails server okay so you can just type uh, just do, do a simple uh, bundle exec Rails server which basically uh, starts up the uh, which starts up your uh, Puma server right and because you all run this in production mode you basically put in the Rails end to tell it that I'm running this in production mode. Uh, bundle exact rails server and you do a dash d here to kind of like make it go uh, go into daemon mode so once you run this you basically go into the background so you don't need to have your ssh session turned on all the time one other thing you want to do is also bind it to a to a to a public ip so on the on the server itself you by default it binds to the local ip which is 127.0.0.1 uh, but you're running this on the server side you probably want to bind it to the the network port to the network card which is uh, attached to the public la, as in so that you can actually open on your browser on your local machine and then view the the files there so so as a rule you can bind it to 0 .0 0.0.0.0 which means you bind to any port any any ip that uh, your virtual machine has access to or if you're really kind of locked down you probably want to then um, bind it to a specific ip address in my case, I'm also, in this case, I'm also po uh, pointing it to port 3000. So it's a default. It's a default port, la. So if you start a real, a real server, you will, it will open up in port 3000. But if you want to host this from port 80, you can do that as well. You can do this in port 80 as well. So it opens up in the, as a default uh, uh, browser, browser uh, default uh, um, <coughs> port. Uh, but then again, it depends a lot. A lot. A lot of this depends on what your firewall rules are on on your virtual machine so you probably need to check out what kind of ports are open for you from from the from the firewall on on your on your ser local server another thing about uh, in, on on linux servers if you try to host something on port 80 you do need to be root you need, do need to be a sudo user so uh, something to take note of we were doing this so usually i'll just go 3000 and then i can just uh, see everything on port 3000 so basically once i have this run, i run this line i should be able to see my app running on port 3000 uh, from the url which is given to me so if your your server itself for example is uh, running uh all right so so it's an example if you're using it uh you have the direct IP address at one two three dot dot one two three dot two dot two for example. If you know the IP address, you can just go straight to it, right? Or if you already have a fully qualified domain which is attached to the thing, like for example, uh, Rails experiment dot internal uh, dot company dot com for for example, right? For example, you have something like this, then you can probably use this as a way of like reaching that server and of course probably thousand right so this will be probably something you want to uh, ask your ops team that like what are they, what, are they, what have they given you or what are, what uh, IP address they've assigned to the to the server la, so that you can basically hit it like that uh, another few things you want to take note of when you're running this on your local uh, on the virtual machine uh, is that you there's a couple of uh, rails environments that you want to set up or rather uh, environment variables you want to set up 
when you're running in production mode, you want to set up the secret key base. I think a lot of us, when we do stuff uh, in uh, in Heroku, we don't actually care about the secret key base because it's also generated for us. Uh, but if you're running this on your on uh, you're running this uh, on on premise, you probably need to uh, be mindful of this one, which is a secret key you need to set up. Like if we uh, will also just blow up if we if we don't set this uh, have this environment variable set set up. Uh, then also you want to turn this on uh, in Rails 5 on, onwards that you will set this environment variable you, your Rails set will then be able to serve all your static assets so do be do be mindful of that uh, another thing you want to take note of is this thing called asset host is another so in your production uh, dot rb you probably can see this so this is helpful for setting up like a, a CDN so if, for example you are hosting your assets on a different server from your from your server from your real server so you can actually set this up separately so these are three notable environment variables you want to set up uh, maybe you might also want to use uh, something like uh, uh, .env right so if you use .env to you uh, if you use .env to kind of manage your environment variables all you need to do is to uh, you know uh, place all the envas in in a file called .env, la, right? So once you have the env file, uh, it's a lot easier to manage it. La. So otherwise, you need to then otherwise you need to um, you know figure out how to actually update the bash rc or some other thing in your in your server so they can they have all these environment variables available. So it's probably not that easy and straightforward if you are not experienced in managing the servers. Uh, so we will dot env as a package as a gem. Um, I'm not sure where you guys all use this. I'm sure you all use it in local uh, local dev environment, right? Dot uh, env will be yeah. So you can use something like this, and all you need to do is save a dot env file. Uh, yeah, and then you basically have access to, to the you can, when your Rails startup, you have all the environment variables that you that you need, lah. Um, right, let me just include this link here. Okay, so that's running your Rails uh, app um, just simply using the Rails server. You can also use Foreman. So using Foreman is uh, probably one more like you can run multiple processes in Foreman. So you can run your Rails server and your Sidekick background worker and everything all from one command line. And all you need to do is keep a file called proc, uh, called proc file, which tells us what processes to run to along with it. So it starts a main 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 process and then it sp and, sp and opens up a few other processes along the way. So you can run the Rails uh, uh, server plus your Sidekick, or if you're using cr uh, some uh, Chronos for your uh, scheduled jobs, you can actually run all three processes from one place, lah. A ghetto style of doing this, uh, or rather really e uh, no frills way of doing this is to basically first of all SSH into the remote server, uh, start a tmux session which is a um, Windows multi is a Linux multiplexing. So basically we can think of it as tap browsing on 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 on, uh, on the terminal. So you just run tmux and by typing tmux and, and type and running tmux into the shell, and basically you start the process. The uh, basically type. Proc uh, format start uh, in the folder, and then what you do is you exit or, or detach from the tmux session. So it's always uh, so you always have a terminal session running there in the background, and you have uh, format running as well. Uh, if you're a bit more experienced in running in managing servers, you can always uh, use uh, format and use that to export into uh, something like um, Upstart or System D. These are kind of like uh, process uh, um, initializers. Think of it as startup scripts that that run when your server starts up. So uh, so you can use this. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, Foreman, you can do an export, uh, and it can export into either Upstart or into uh, I think can you also do is it here uh, Upstart or uh, over here. So you can. Look at the man page. You can export into System D, so which will basically uh, init, uh, shows you how to you you export some uh, into your uh, into the operating system to tell it how to start up this uh, process as the as the server uh, starts up. Or if you're using a, a, an older version of Ubuntu, you probably want something upstart for that. Uh, and a few others here you can try. So 
um, yeah, so this is another way of running your format in the, in the uh, running a server using format. So these are all the examples I that are basically you roll your own, you roll your own, uh, uh, you roll everything on your own. You basically install Ruby on your own. You install, uh, you install Ruby on your own. You uh, think about how to develop your app such that you have to build roll everything on your own. Uh, how to deploy it? You gotta do everything on your own. You gotta learn how to actually start the server on the start the real server on your own, right? So there's a lot of this roll your own stuff. But there's also an option which is a, which can make things a bit easier, which is to have a fake cloud kind of way. <laughs> a fake cloud basically having some form of like cloud like uh, things on your on your on for yourself. For example, we can roll your own using Docker uh, Docker community uh, Docker community edition. So basically, install Docker on the on the server itself, and then use things like Docker Compose to start up your Rails app along with the supporting services like Postgres, uh, Redis, and a few other things. You can use the Docker Compose to start it all up. Like. Um, if you also want something really simple, you can also use something like Doku. Doku is a very nice. Uh, it's a mini. Uh, platform as a service. So think of it as Heroku, but on premise, but very very small scale. Uh, so you can actually run it on one single node, and it's based on it's based on Docker as well. So basically, what you do you do is git you do a, a once you have this installed, you just need to do a git push to the server, and you basically spin up like Heroku. You spin up a uh, application uh, using build packs and all that stuff. So which is a lot easier, right? So this is another option you can use to make things a lot easier. Um, so what about Kubernetes? If you're just experimenting, you ain't gonna need it. That's what Yagni is. You are not gonna need it. So you ain't gonna need it. So don't use it, please, if you're just experimenting because you don't want to kill yourself with all the manifest configuration and all that stuff. It's not worth the effort. So yeah, so if you do want to go with a fake cloud, which is to have Docker containers, uh, and also have some form of like supporting services that spin up together with your Rails app. I guess a lot of tutorials out there to teach you how to actually bundle or package your Rails application as a Docker container. So it is a lot. So when you do that, probably it'll be a lot easier to do all this using. Uh, uh, you can use things like Docker or Community Edition, or you can use Doku, which is also quite nice and it uses build packs and stuff. Uh, yeah. So that's the all I have for the experimental part, right? So how about productionizing? Uh, so I think we already used up like 20, 30 plus minutes. So uh, yeah, so I think I can do the productionizing part as a part two. So in the future, we can do another session. I can share a bit more about that. Uh, yeah, uh, and that's all I have. Any questions? Mm, okay. Uh -oh. I didn't know. Oh, we can leave the. If you have any questions, but you are uh, a bit shy to ask, you can ask in the GitHub issue or in the Ruby Slack channel. Uh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thank you, Michael, for the talk. Yay. Yes. Okay. So.